All right, everybody, thank you for joining. Um, this, again, is a webinar showcasing a live EFTO workshop featuring the White Block Genesis platform. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to just go to the chat, ask a question, participate with the audience. Uh, Trent is here to organize those questions, help you get situated, and uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. We'll make sure of that. Uh, so make yourself comfortable, and we're going to get started right away. So today joining me, uh, with the pleasure of introducing to you guys uh, Vitalik Buterin, uh, founder of Ethereum and researcher on Ethereum 2, uh, Preston Von wow. who's working on PRISM as part of Prismatic Labs, uh, Jay Mulzer from Pegasus, working on the Artemis client, and myself, Antoine, from WebLock. Uh, we have a packed agenda today. So we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, we're going to first discuss the Genesis platform, uh, just introduce you where we're coming from in terms of distributed systems testing. Then uh, Vitalik will take us on a tour of Ethereum in Ethereum 2.0. Um, we're going to have some time for uh, Preston and Jem to uh, introduce themselves, their team, the effort they're involved in, the client that they're working on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the challenges that are ahead of us and that we're working on right now in terms of interoperability for networking. Uh, we'll do a short demo on the white block Genesis platform to showcase how we can manipulate network conditions to, to make things happen. And uh, we'll have then plenty of time for Q&A. We have uh, already some questions and topics that popped up in the chat. Uh, let's uh, make sure we get time for that. So just going to take uh, five minutes of your time and we're going to talk a little bit about the White Block Genesis platform. So White Block Genesis has been around for 18 months. We are an end-to-end -end testing and development platform for distributed systems. Um, we are being leveraged by if 2.0 implementers so they can actually test their test net in isolation and make sure that everything works. We're still used by distributed systems in general, IoT, uh, other blockchains. Um, Genesis platform has comprehensive set of features. Uh, we have the ability to offer granular control over every one of the nodes in your network, you know, running them into a different VLAN for each of them. Uh, we can control uh, bandwidth, latency, uh, network blackouts between all nodes or just one network connection. We're protocol agnostic. We support over 20 different uh, blockchain protocols, including, of course, Ethereum and Ethereum 2.0, um, allowing to reuse and leverage the unique functionalities of, his, of those chains so that we can get the data, we can actually analyze what's going on. Um, talking about analyzing, we have powerful analytics bundled in, so we give you access to your data, your blog data, your log data. Uh, we make it available to you so you can work with it with data science tools, which are best in breed on market today, such as Jupyter Notebooks. Um, all this comes fully automated. In less than 30 seconds, you can set up a test net, uh, you can get it going, you can automate that as part of your CI CD pipeline, and uh, everything works well with your existing tooling, so you can just wish away all your complex testing and it's just going to happen automatically going forward. The way we uh, interface with developers today is using a command line interface uh, that allows you to control, command individual nodes, uh, configuring a set of uh, advances and observe them performance in real time. Uh, also comes with a complete uh, SDK and API, so people can integrate that into Jenkins or CircleCI, Concourse, all those uh, test suites that exist today. All right, so just sum up, so we know about this a little bit, so why Block Genesis is the all-in-one testing platform for blockchain and distributed systems. Uh, very helpful for any Web3 uh, application, be it if you're a DApp developer, a protocol developer, or if you're just looking at a very complex deployment with many moving pieces. We offer for you a robust, a robust test suite that you can use for any type of integration with your CI CD pipeline. Um, every stage of the lifecycle of your platform, we can help you. We can help you from the point of view of simple development and staging, prototyping, proofing, um, benchmarking, to the point of running migrations, upgrades, uh, hard forks, and making sure that you don't see um, performance degradation between releases. This is what we can help you with. So we're going to see how this plays into Ethereum. 
Um, I'm going to invite our next speaker, uh, Vitalik, to talk a little bit about uh, Ethereum and Ethereum 2. Vitalik, are you with us? Yes, hello. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Okay, excellent. Um, so I guess I'll start off by just giving a general kind of overview into what Ethereum 2.0 is and kind of where we're uh, at right now progress-wise. Uh, so the basic idea behind Ethereum 2.0 is that it's this major upgrade to Ethereum whose two flagship features are uh, number one, Casper, a uh, proof of stake mm -hmm. algorithm, which is intended to uh, replace uh, the current uh, proof of work mechanism. And uh, number two, sharding, which is the scalability technology that basically says, instead of every computer needing to verify every transaction, we just have every transaction be verified by a small random subset of all of the participants uh, or all, all of the validators uh, in the network. Uh, so Ethereum 2.0 is the specification. There is a specification that we've been working on and at uh, github.com slash ethereum slash eth 2.0 specs if someone wants to put the url wherever people will see it um there's the specifications of uh, what we've been uh, developing uh, so far but but in general eth 2.0 has uh, been split up broadly into four phases the first phase uh, that we call phase zero is basically creating a uh, proof of stake chain. Uh, so using uh, Casper FFG plus uh, LMD Ghost, that's uh, the proof of stake algorithm that we've been working on for uh, a few years that's been inspired by a traditional Byzantine fault tolerance uh, theory um, and uh, some uh, traditional proof of stake um, has this uh, concept of economic finality and uh, phase zero is just that without any ability to process transactions right so phase zero is basically just about uh, creating this proof of stake chain that can just have a chain and keep the chain growing and allow people to deposit um, ether from the ethereum one network into this new ethereum two chain and basically just kind of get the thing running. Uh, phase one after that is when we plan to add uh, shards and uh, data on shards. So the way that shards work is that there's uh, 1,024 uh, different shards, um, each of which uh, you can think of as being kind of like sub blockchains. So they're blockchains, but they're not quite independent because they depend on this kind of central beacon chain that, that we're launching in phase zero for their consensus and that they uh, also have talk with the uh, beacon chain. Um, and on each of these 1,024 shard chains, there will be um, on average uh, 16 kilobytes of uh, space every block, but the block size could go up to 64 kilobytes where you can publish data. Uh, and in phase one by itself, the data doesn't mean anything. Um, but the idea here is to basically have all of the uh, infrastructure for actually managing a sharded blockchain kind of running in, in, its, uh, in its full form, right? So if you are a validator, so if you're someone who deposited Ether, then in phase zero, you'll just be signing blocks and maintaining the chain. In phase one, you will also have this responsibility to be verifying uh, blocks on a random shard that you get assigned to, and you get frequently reassigned between different shards. And you'll have to verify these blocks, create blocks on shards, and sign off on attestations that um, contain pointers to those blocks to basically link those blocks up to, uh, the, to the beacon chain. Uh, so, in phase one, like basically, there will be data scalability. <coughs> um, and at current proposed uh, numbers, the Ethereum blockchain will be able to pr uh, process about five megabytes per second of data, which is about 500 times uh, or 500 to 600 times more than the theoretical maximum right now. Um, but it will not be able to process like, smart contracts or any kind of code execution uh, yet. In phase two, 
uh, we will be adding um, basically the, the ability to have code executed on chain and to have Ether actually be controlled by that code. And we're doing it through this uh, mechanism uh, called um, execution environments, where basically there exist these uh, kind of bottom level uh, smart contracts on the beacon chain that hold ETH and that implement internal logic, where that in parts of that internal logic get executed on shard chains. And on top of those systems, you can emulate things like uh, a scalable version of uh, the existing Ethereum system, among other things. So at phase two, you will basically be able to do scalably what you're able to do uh, with Ethereum now. And then phase three is any improvements that we want to do after phase two. So this could Im include increasing use of uh, Starks for security. This could include switching from uh, Casper FFG to uh, Casper CBC. Um, yes, I said five megabytes a second. The, the way I got that number is uh, 16 kilobytes uh, divided by three seconds and multiplied by 1,024 shards. Um, I mean, still subjects to change uh, depending on what networking uh, kind of people end up uh, end up saying and what tests ends up revealing, but that's kind of the goal at this point. Um, so in phase three, things like CBC, things like adding in Starks, uh, just generally improving the uh, eff efficiency of the system. If we discover any improvements, then we'll add, then we'll add them in and it uh, keeps on going from there. Um, so and it is possible that after phase three, that we're not really going to need any more kind of fundamental changes to the Ethereum chain structure. And it will be possible to do pretty much anything that we want to do on top of just this uh, kind of quadratic sharded system and uh, of layer, layer twos and the execution environments that get built on top of it. So at least one of my own personal goals is to try to set up the system so that after all of these phases get fully implemented, there isn't really much need for a continued rejuggling of the base layer, and most of the innovation can happen through these ex uh, through these execution environments. I know there have been some presentations about how these execution environments work publicly, but I maybe don't want to go into too deeply because we didn't we don't have um, infinite time here. So that's basically the roadmap um, in terms of actual progress. The phase zero spec has been frozen. There's a lot of people hard at work on uh, nailing down implementation of phase zero, getting clients to talk to each other, figuring out how all the networking is going to uh, work at scale. Um, phase one, the spec is in the process of being nailed down. And it's um, there's people starting to look at implementing it. Though in terms of like, spec-wise, phase one is still considerably is smaller than uh, phase zero. Um, so the bulk of the complexity of phase one, I think will basically be just managing this idea that you have data flying around in different shards and clients that have to talk to different shards and not every node is, rece is uh, receiving every transaction. And then for phase two, a, a lot, there's a lot of kind of current um, ongoing research and thinking around like how concretely, like what execution environments could concretely be built and how they would work. Um, yeah, and if there's anything specific people want me to talk about, I'm happy to. I mean, otherwise, happy for other people to talk as well. Yeah, absolutely, Vitalik. Thank you so much for this overview. Um, well, we'll get to questions at the end. So if any questions, okay. that, uh, we'll be able to take that at the time. Um, looking to move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Jim, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about one of the clients that is working on the EFAM2 specification right now. Jim, are you here? Yep. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so before I talk about like Artemis, our Ethereum 2.0 client, I want to talk a bit about like Pegasus, the company behind Artemis. If we can move to the next slide. So uh, the main goals of like Pegasus is to maintain and scale Ethereum and also to lower the barriers to entry to like Ethereum specifically for enterprises. So we have like three pillars. Uh, one of them is like product. We already have like a mainnet client, Pantheon running. 
And then we have an R&D side where we work on Ethereum 2.0 implementation, as well as privacy and side chains. And then we also have a standard side where we push for like better open standards for privacy permissioning, uh, especially with like enterprise Ethereum alliance, so that like it's easier for like companies to come in and join Ethereum. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So Artemis is our scalable and extensible Ethereum 2.0 client. Uh, it has a microservice architecture to allow distributed deployment and ease load balancing. It's enterprise friendly due to its permiss permissive Apache 2.0 license and the fact that it's written in Java. Also, it's future proof because it's the only team with a current live Ethereum 1.0 client that has a team dedicated to implementing Ethereum 2.0 as well. And it's highly performant because we've always been building it with a focus on modular architecture and performance in mind. So to talk about the team uh, on the next slide, uh, our team lead, our team lead is John Ray in the middle. Uh, he has like uh, experience ranging from uh, ranging from aerospace to data science and on mission critical software, and he is overseeing the project. Uh, Steven Schroeder on the right top. Uh, he has background in security and like mainframes, and he's focusing on testing and serialization. Uh, Shahan on the bottom right uh, is one of the actually co-founders of Pegasus. And he's currently just joined like our team two weeks ago and he's focusing on our, the P2P JVM implementation. Uh, Joe Dulong on the bottom left, he has extensive research in blockchain research, uh, more than three years and he's uh, focusing on our Ethereum 1.0 uh, integration and uh, currently testing. Me on the top left, uh, I've, I've been working on state transition, validator client and currently working with Steven on serialization stuff. If there are any, any client, if there are any questions about Artemis, I'm uh, very open to uh, answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, we'll take those questions as they come. Um, I think next we have uh, Preston, who's going to talk a little bit about Prismatic Labs and Prism. Preston, can you hear me? Hey, I'm here. Uh, oh, yeah. Great. You guys can hear me all right? Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So uh, Prismatic Labs, um, we're an independent team um, only focused on working on Ethereum 2.0. Um, Raul, Jordan, and I, the first two people on the top left there, founded this team at the beginning of uh, 2018 um, based on like a, there was a wiki article on GitHub that's talked about sharding and we were all thinking, you know, how do we get involved and make sharding happen and get Ethereum scaling uh, get Ethereum to scale faster. So um, we all met online on various chat rooms and through email and said, hey, let's let's just start working on this uh, just for fun. Um, and over the last uh, year and a half, almost, yeah, a year and a half now, it's really grown into to a, a full-size team. We have six people now working on this project. Uh, we've had, this number is actually a little outdated. We've had over 50 open source contributors um, bringing onto the project different uh, variety of expertise. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about our client, uh, Prism. So we could go to the next slide. Um, Prism is a ETH2 client written in the Go programming language. And what we're targeting are highly available production ready deployments. So what that means is we're utilizing a client and server architecture where you have the bulk of the work put into a server called the beacon node and then you have the client which is the actual validator and to stay highly available you would have want to run you know multiple uh, beacon chain deployments um, in your in your infrastructure um, so that's something we've been targeting from day one is we want to have a high uptime guarantees uh, with a highly available configuration. And the next most important thing for us is really visibility on what's going on inside your client. Uh, if you're running these um, in a distributed fashion, it's kind of hard to follow logs and get good, good um, visualization from all of that. So we're adding in uh, metrics first. Um, so we've, we have instrumentation as part of the, the binaries, if you're interested in that kind of thing you know, where, uh, 
where is most of the time spent in in the code and how can that be improved upon? That's automatically uh, baked in with uh, the client. And in the, going forward, um, our philosophy with with writing this this code is that we're a very design driven approach. So when we see the spec from uh, the research team, we'll take it and parse it, uh, and then kind of come up with our own uh, design spec on how we're going to implement this. And what we end up with is something that's uh, very well tested. So we have you know unit tests on it, all the core logic. Everything's really well documented as a result, and just the code is really easy to read and understand, and we're uh, at less of risk of, of bug slipping in that way. And then our final, our final feature here is that we are optimizing the client for performance, um, as well as ease of access for, for, for data, uh, data access. So we have an API where you can query against historical data, so asking, you know, what happened in Epoch 10 um, and sort of rebuild an image for your analytical tools or block explorers. And that's me. That's Prism. If you have any questions, uh, write those in the chat or send them to Trent. And we'll answer at the end. Thanks. Thank you so much, Preston. And uh, thanks for all the stunning points that I think is going to make my job in the next few slides easier. Uh, so we're going to move a little bit into a different discussion. We're going to talk a little bit about blockchain networking. We're going to talk about the challenges of Ethereum 2. I think you heard in the last uh, 10 minutes that there's a lot of challenges related to the sheer performance numbers that we're trying to, trying to reach for. So let's go and talk a little bit about that. And uh, we're still ahead of us. Uh, we have a demo of uh, Genesis uh, with if 2 And then we'll open up for questions. So... Um, you know, the audience here is probably very savvy, but uh, I think it's a good idea to also just talk about in general about blockchain networking. Um, we're probably used to the old paradigm of uh, client and server, um, where the server is well known, uh, clients can connect to them using a reliable network connection. In blockchain, you get none of that safety. Now, clients are also servers, and we're now in a peer to peer network situation. Um, so the unique challenges of blockchain networking is first to do a peer discovery where you can find the other peers that are exposing the same chain that you're looking for. Uh, to have security throughout, uh, from you know handshake to encryption uh, to securing the, the network layer, but also checking that you get cryptographic proof of the data that you receive. So you're not being fed bad blocks or bad transactions that may actually uh, create adverse reactions to the rest of the network. And um, we want to also have a fast propagation time for blocks, for attestations, for any elements which are essential to the consensus mechanism. Um, so, you know, so far in the, um, the blockchain space, uh, we've seen a few use cases which have been leveraged heavily by the different blockchains. The first one is, of course, to have a set of boot nodes that are always running and they're statically assigned IPs and they allow kind of an entrance door to, to the rest of the nodes I want to connect, at least initially, uh, to supplement those nodes so that they can scale further than themselves, we use what we call distributed hash table that allows others to um, connect to a set of peers, ask for more information from some of the nodes that they know about, and to download a portion of a global hash table of all the peers available on the network. So this gives a resilience to the global network. Uh, and allows um, avoiding situations where the network could be split into smaller pieces. Um, for every, as I mentioned, for every block, every piece of data that is being transited over the network, you would want to make cryptographic verifications of everything that you receive, see, you know, be it by uh, signing it with a key, but also just checking that this block has been verified against the previous block and that there is a match in the chain. Uh, finally, uh, and this we'll talk about a little bit today, I hope, uh, there are a lot of strategies around gossiping and syncing data. Um, some of the most novel ones have been tried with the if one chain. Uh, here we're going to talk about the approach we're taking with Ethereum 2, and this is going to be our next slide. So in Ethereum 2 networking, um, we have a unique need to do discovery 
And since we have the presence of shards, we will need to have different groups that will need to autonomously discover each other using the same distributed hash table. So for that reason, we're contemplating using Discovery V5, which has been uh, developed by Felix Lange from the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, Discovery V5 uh, allows nodes to broadcast topics and to broadcast capabilities that they are uh, able to perform, which would allow self-organization of the nodes on top of a common mesh of networks. Um, we also are working on those sync algorithm. So right now we want to make sure that we want to be able to sync really quickly. Um, we have to be able to sync within uh, block time. I know that the current block time is uh, considered to be six seconds, and that's something that we are discussing to see if we can uh, change out of the time. Um, we also have work with validators. Validators run next to the chain itself and are performing votes. And it must happen between uh, inside the block time so that we can get votes in time. Um, a challenge that's really unique to Ethereum too, I think, uh, is that we have nine different client teams and all different stages of standardization and productization of the clients, but they all come from different perspectives with very different needs. Uh, some of them are, as a, we've seen, written in Go. Some of them are more enterprise friendly, written in Java. We also see some of those efforts being built towards mobile or uh, very uh, specific setups for embedded devices and systems. Uh, so as a result, um, the implementers and the researchers have chosen to standardize the network stack on uh, lib 2 p which is a complex uh, set of framework for uh, networking. This is maintained by Protocol Labs, the makers of IPFS and Filecoin. Um, lib 2 p itself ha is a modular stack, so we can still decide a little bit uh, what type of components we want to involve. So for example, here we have, in terms of handshake, uh, a choice between Sekayo, Noise, or TLS 1.3. Uh, those choices need to be made based on the availability of those components in those different languages and to make sure that we're able to move at a comfortable pace towards implementation. Uh, last but not least, we have to actually agree on a number of common set of messages. So the protocol itself needs to lend itself to all those thinking strategies and all those business needs of the consensus algorithm so we can perform a really, you know, you know, sh relatively short amount of time uh, synchronization between clients from propagation to catching up the chain. Um, all those things need to happen using those messages. So um, there's something that um, is pretty hot right now is talk a little bit about also the light clients. Uh, light clients are something that are uh, dear to Vitalik and I hope I can grill him a little bit in the Q&A session about that. Um, when Ethereum 2 was announced, uh, Vitalik went to create a new way to standardize and serialize block data using a um, specification called simple serialize. It's a very simple byte representation that allows a deterministic byte representation of any piece of data, meaning that you are actually able to say that a certain index, a portion of the block data is going to be forming from that element. That allows you using a Merkle tree to create a proof where you would be able to check that a portion of the block is present in the block just by knowing uh, which index it is at in the block. So we can actually now create very light clients that can just uh, gossip all those proofs and would allow us to make sure that cryptographically we are securely uh, passing around a portion of the block that is uh, important to us as part of this. So as part of that, so now we have the ability to create a new network protocol for light clients, and we have to, the ability to create light clients in general for Ethereum 2 um, that will have a much uh, lesser computation overhead and we'll be able to send simpler messages. So we'll be able to very quickly generalize a lot of the Ethereum 2 changes in this approach. Um, so I hope that we will get to talk a little bit more about that. Now, um, 
One thing that uh, we've been working hard at is to make sure that all the clients are able to talk to each other and that we're able to hammer out uh, all the network needs that we've had. And uh, one thing that is for sure needed is to make sure that we are able to communicate clearly between those client teams. So that re might require, sometimes we have more communication. We use Discord, we use Telegram. Um, we've been using Gitter as well. Uh, we also have regular meetings and uh, we have meetings in MeetSpace to make sure that we're able to meet face-to-face, -face, know each other, create um, kind of a collaborative approach to how we're working. This is not different from any open source project. Um, it's just, it's a massive effort across the planet. Uh, in terms of how we go about it, we try to simplify the problem of uh, creating a complete blockchain to simple tests that we can operate with uh, in an isolated fashion. One of those tests that we started with was what we call the cold start, and it's now a um, present on the if 2 pm repository. So the researchers, the implementers came together and decided how they're going to simulate uh, an if um, 2 Genesis event so we can actually make sure that all the clients start at the same time, are able to gossip blocks, are able to come to consensus and get the same blocks across. Um, we also have uh, a set of tests and set of strategies which are being etched right now by uh, different teams on syncing client with a running testnet. So we would start a testnet, it would go on for a couple of minutes and then we'd be able to have another client start up, catch up with the testnet, request data as it comes up. And we're now we're able to do a couple of strategies. The first one is kind of a simple strat strategy in the first test that we'd be running is a simple full sync where you keep asking for new blocks until you catch up with the chain. Another one uh, that we might want to look at is to have another strategy where we use the finalization of if 2 so you don't have to catch up to the whole chain. You can also just request the latest finalized block and kind of go from there a little bit while you catch up to the rest of the chain in parallel. Of Finally, and probably one of the crispier aspects of this is uh, to have the right gossiping strategy. So um, I hope we get to talk about that a little bit. Uh, right now we use gossip sub from lip 2 p uh, It comes with a set of assumptions and variables. Um, I heard from Preston that we might be able to kind of change those variables, see how things fare. Uh, we want to make sure that we get the maximum throughput out of this gossiping strategy without flooding the network. So um, we're going to now show you a little bit of a demo, a uh, demo of Genesis with uh, an if2 client, Artemis. Um, we're going to show you how Genesis can be of help for an if2 client as we are going to try to test as much as possible a real network out there on the internet. So here it is. So we're going to start building an Artemis client. We're going to get 10 nodes for it. Um, we're not setting any limits. We're going to have four validators per node. Now we're sending that build context to WebBlock. And then what we're doing is we're starting 10 different nodes of Artemis in different geographical locations, such as one of them, each of them gets their own VLAN, their own isolated network that allows us to create as if a node was in Japan, as a node was in Paris. We also provision the nodes with accounts. We add funds, so everything is already ready to go by the end of the build. Now, uh, we can see the nodes as they go. We can see their utilization. We can see how fast they are. Um, we can see if they're studied correctly, all this good stuff. Um, what we want to see also is kind of the log, um, how things are going you know, inside that. Node. So here we can actually see how things are going, but we can also attach ourselves to that log so we can see how it's going over time. I mentioned this before, um, one of the core features of Genesis is to manipulate the network. So here we're going to show you how we can change, uh, add some delay and change the bandwidth for the whole network. Now you can see here, um, we're going to just test that with a ping and uh, you can see that we added 10 milliseconds and uh, this exactly is being reflected here. You can also test that with an iperf command that showcases the bandwidth. Now, of course, these are interactive tests and at any point in time, you may want to go back and clear those up so you can start again.
we can also do a little um, nifty thing where we can cut a connection between two nodes explicitly. Now you can see here, we just cut the connection between node zero and node one. And now if you try to ping between those two, it won't work anymore. At any point in time, I can also decide to uncut that connection and get it back. So that's impressive, but on top of that, we can now also partition the network so we can actually create a real rift between uh, different nodes of the network. So now we're going to isolate uh, node zero and node one into their own partition. There we go, we got a success of that. We can still see that the pinging works. But if we try to ping from node one to two, for example, we see a big empty void. Same thing with zero to two. At any point in time, we can choose to reconcile this network. And there you go, it's working again. So some of the instrumentation we allow also is based on uh, the ability for us to interface with the software running inside the nodes. And for that, we allow you to SSH directly inside the, the node itself in its uh, software. So you can actually see how things are going inside. You can see this, every file, everything is available to you. You can perform all sorts of tooling and testing inside the node itself. But that's not good enough because sometimes you'll be running this without the help of an operator. So if you were to do that using, for example, Jenkins, you might want to be able to run PSAUX from the outside and get that output right away. And there we see here Artemis, um, the whole class path Java here. And uh, that is pretty much it for demo. So I promise that we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. And, oops. And uh, this is exactly what we're going to do now. Uh, I know Trent has been collecting a lot of uh, questions from our participants, and uh, I'd love it if, uh, if we could get started on those questions. Trent, are you here? Sure, yeah. Can you hear me? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Great, yeah. So we had originally gotten some questions through email, so I'll start with those. Um, the first one is somebody's asking how you can, what, what sort of outputs you can uh, run with Genesis platform and like what you can actually do with the data that you're you're getting from the logs. Like why is it useful? Right. So um, this short demo is showcasing a little bit like what you would do in terms of testing, how it can play up as an operator. Um, one thing it's not showing, we have another demo for that that's available on YouTube, is that you can also export all the data that has been collected as part of the run. So you can actually test and get the data that each of the 10 nodes, for example, here we're collecting. Um, we collect log data, we collect blog data, we can collect even more data as needed. We can, for example, interface with Prometheus, get metrics, all this good stuff. And uh, we make it available to you using the CLI. So you can actually download that data down to your laptop and perform all sorts of analytics. Uh, we also have the ability for you to interface this data with Jupyter Notebooks, so you can perform all sorts of uh, advanced analytics, uh, parser logs. Uh, we recently did this with GEF, where we were able to get the block propagation times by parsing logs and comparing with the timestamp of a particular block. So uh, all this is available to you. Um, yeah, this demo does not show that, but we have the ability to do that, on, and you can see it on YouTube. Great. Um, another question. Is Genesis only for uh, testing blockchains or can it do other uh, more distributed systems type testing? Very good question. So uh, the amount, the, the unit of compute that is required to interface with Genesis is a Docker image. We actually do not really care as long as you're exposing network conditions, network between the different nodes, uh, we will be able to satisfy that and we can create any sort of complex distributed networks. We can you know, create uh, geographical replication, for example. So we can be a good um, test bench, for example, for a Cassandra cluster, a Kafka cluster, even just a RabbitMQ replication cluster, um, depending on the, the needs of the enterprise. So um, we also have been looking at 
uh, getting more involved into IoT use cases, especially as the, we will need to uh, simulate a number of devices at the edge and a number of queues. So all those use cases are in our, um, that are things that we support at this time. Awesome. Uh, so I think this next one probably is best answered by either Preston or Vitalik. Um, and I'll just read it off. Uh, standardized network messages seem crucial for implementing phase zero and multiple clients. Why is network messages not a part of the phase zero spec? And does it have its own upcoming spec? There is a document that contains standards for those things, right? Yeah, that's a new thing that came out last uh, week, I think. The, net the networking spec, the new one, does have message types defined. And they're all uh, uh, SSE encoded messages right at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely su support considering integrating that more closely into the rest of the spec. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's just being developed in, in a separate document, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's on the same repository, so you should be able to find it. And the second part of the question, I think, was why is this important? Um, and that's that's because we, in order for it to have a, a true multi-client testnet, they need to be messages need to be compatible, encoding, decoding, um, the formats, the the data structures all need to be the same to have that compatibility. So we have been working on that recently. That's sort of like the, f the most recent update in the specs repository uh, in terms of phase zero stuff, as far as I know. Great. Um, so another general question, if somebody wanted to uh, test some hypothesis, what specific things could they do? And maybe this is directed at Antoine, but how could they use Genesis to test specific assumptions about uh, network capacity or something? Oh, yeah. So um, I think this is actually something that uh, we answer very generically when we discover clients what they want. Uh, we have a methodology by which we take them through a series of tests, and we have a test plan approach to, to everything we do. So um, I'll give you an example, but it really is uh, something that we work in collaboration with, with people as they come to us. Um, a good example would be that um, usually what they have is their uh, a brand new uh, blockchain, in which case what they want to see is degradation of a real network traffic. Uh, so, for example, we start with a control group with no problems whatsoever, and then we make it worse and worse and worse by just applying uh, factors of uh, noise and bandwidth limitation uh, until we reach kind of abysmal uh, quality conditions. Um, some folks come to us now with much more mature solutions, which have been in production for a while. Uh, we had this case, for example, recently where people came to us with a um, wanted to change GIF ever so slightly and asked us for a, a variation of that GIF client, right? So we were able to, to test and actually benchmark one against the other so we could tell them you know, confidently what was going on there. Um, a key point of that was we had to, uh, to test it with a mainnet state so we are now supporting the ability for folks to test it with the actual Ethereum mainnet state as part of a nationalized setup, which gives folks a you know, very comfortable feeling. Um, you know, we can repeat those tests. We can really make it easy on them. Uh, they're really comfortable then pushing those results and making use of them. Uh, let's see the next question. Is there a write-up on the process of gossiping data over SSE via Merkle proofs? And this question for Vitalik, I think. Was that gossiping SSE via Merkle proofs? Gossiping data over SSE via Merkle proofs. Right. Um, I guess what's the specific problem that we're that you're trying to solve there? Because so, like for example. There's going to be some cases where like a client needs some specific piece of data, and then for that you would provide an SSE Merkle multi um, multi proof, and those could be network messages, or are we talking about something else? Um, not not sure. It, if there's anything unresolved from our our Q and A here, we can just go to the uh, the white block Telegram, and if people have con uh, continued questions after this, we can. 
get get a little bit more in depth there. Um, yeah. Let's see. A question about Prism. How does Prism plan to use Genesis uh, and its relationship to how they might test Gossip Sub? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, what we want to do is is figure out how the performance changes between uh, different configurations with with Gossip Sub. So there are a lot of you know parameters that define the algorithm on how messages should be relayed once you've received a message. You know how many peers do you send it to, and what the uh, like heartbeat timeout and things like that. Um, we'd we'd really like to see that we've we've already landed on the ideal um, parameters for that for for the network of the size we're expecting and also um, it, it would for, it would further give evidence to the six second block time if we're able to to propagate uh, fully to the edge of the network we think we can understand this kind of logic in a framework like like white block um, with their their analytics and uh, data collection uh, one more thing we would would like to see is the um, the you know CPU and memory performance trade offs of adding something like a snappy compression to the networking protocol to see you know is the trade off in bandwidth worth the trade off in um, computing and resources. So we have a couple experiments we want to run in the next couple of months, and we're really looking forward to it. Awesome. Next question is for the Artemis attendees uh, and they're wondering if there's been any fuzz testing on the E2 implementation. Uh, I don't know about what like, has been done on, on the like the white block side, but we haven't started testing like we haven't started testing like fuzz testing on Artems yet. Was there anything that you've done um, to set up the client to make that easier, or like, what, what steps have, has your team taken to prepare for that in the future? Uh, what steps we have taken to prepare that in the future? Yeah, like, what's your general testing? Uh, like, do you guys do any local testing, or is it is it uh, something that's going to happen later with the interop? Yeah, we have a couple forms of tests. Like, one of them is our like uh, our like own like unit tests uh, of like everything from like uh, state transition fun functions to SSC like unit tests. And then we have our integration test where we run like uh, one node to like N nodes and like uh, see if we like uh, get any like uh, errors during like running like uh, you can change from start or from like uh, starting from some specific point. And then we also like uh, comply with like the Ethereum reference test, which all other cl clients are like uh, working with as well. Awesome, thanks. Uh, let me just check. There was a question about um, gossip sub parameters and how how we can actually test what they are, or and um, whether the hard coded parameters are going to work for what ETH2 is trying to accomplish. Hey, I, yeah, I touched on that uh, briefly, but yeah, we, we want to be certain that the, the parameters um, that are defined in the networking spec uh, and defined default parameters for Gossip Sub are going to propagate effectively through the, through the whole network. So that's the experiment we'll want to run on the white block. Cool, thanks. Uh, this is a bit of a more general question for Vitalik. Um, the question is, why are there 1024 shards and is that number expected to change after phase three? Why are there 1024 shards? Um, basically the general um, idea behind picking that number was to try to balance between um, the load of the beacon chain and the load of a single shard, which are the two kind of natural constraints on the size of a quadratic sharded system. So for example, we could have achieved the same scalability if the beacon chain was um, 10, um, 
uh, had uh, 10,000 shards, but each shard would, uh, was uh, 10 times smaller. But then like, there would be an imbalance because the mm -hmm. uh, sharded mm -hmm. system would, um, or because, because each shard would be really easy to process, but on the other hand, the beacon chain would take a hugely powerful like, computer to stay in touch with. And on the other extreme, if we had 10 shards, but every shard was incredibly big, then the beacon chain could be processed like, really easily, but the shards would be really yeah, huge. So the goal of the calculation is to basically try to equalize the two because that's the point at which we can um, maximize the total scalability of the system and it subjects to some particular constraint on the load that we can impose mm -hmm. on any specific computer. Great, thanks. Next question, probably also for you, Vitalik. Um, a while back, I heard that ETH2 would be switching out the Merkle Patricia tree for another data structure. Is this still the case? And if so, what's the new structure and what's the reason for this change? Oh, good question. Um, so I think plans there have been a bit derailed because of this uh, execution environment uh, pivot that's happened over the last few months. And basically the kind of primary thrust of the execution environment's pivot is that the protocol doesn't maintain a kind of a layer one notion of large uh, shard state. So there are small shard states, but they're not going to be larger than uh, the size of a block. Um, but um, what's going to, uh, oh, but inside of execution environments, like they are definitely going to end up implementing their own state schemes and so they'll have to use some kind of data structure. So I've been doing some work over the, uh, on and off over the last uh, year or so on um, optimizing sparse Merkle trees and, and basically um, using binary trees with a slightly different hash function to create a kind of theoretically optimal um, and uh, very simple uh, Merkle tree performance. So that's... Uh, one direction that I think execution environments could end up taking, but they could also end up uh, designing, uh, going in a different direction. Like you could have one do some kind of binary AV, um, AVL tree. You could have one just use some totally different kind of accumulator or, or whatever else. Great. Uh, next question. What are the trade-offs with choosing a fixed shard number? And could that possibly be increased or decreased in the future as demand uh, changes? Yeah. Um, so the main challenge is that from inside of a blockchain protocol, it's extremely hard to measure the level of demand. And like one of the challenges, for example, is that in a mature um, economy, we can expect there to be a huge amount of demand for using the blockchain in extremely trivial ways. So, for example, if the uh, uh, demand for the for putting data in the blockchain starts falling towards zero, eventually transaction fees will become low enough that people will just start using the blockchain as a place to put encrypted backups of their hard drive, and that's incredibly inefficient. But if no other use cases exist, then those then those kinds of use cases will just start popping up and dominating. And so, you can expect to see an equilibrium where like the chain is full or close to full, like regardless of what level it's at. And uh, there is this uh, an approximate level of fees that's being paid, and those fees are denominated in Ether, but if the fees denominated in Ether go up by a factor of 10, is that because demand went up, or is that because the price of Ether went down by a factor of 10, or is that a combination of both? Um, so from inside the protocol, it's just really hard to figure out like what the right uh, shard counts, or even what the right block size for a single shard should be. So that's the main reason why we've gone with this uh, fixed approach for now. But like, it's, if it's kind of decided that it's a good idea to just manually increase the shard count at some point uh, in the future, then I think that's definitely something that could just be done with a hard work. Gotcha. All right, uh, looks like we'll do one last question and then, and then Antoine will wrap up. Um, which ETH2 clients will Genesis be able to 
test against? Was it only Prism and Artemis or will, will there be others? Um, is that a question about Genesis? Um, yeah. We are completely uh, client agnostic in a way that as long as you're speaking Ethereum 2, we will be able to run you. We just need a Docker image that uh, enables us to configure the client and make it run as part of the network. Ideally, what we want to do in a matter of weeks or months is to get to a point where we can actually run test nets with the nine different clients uh, embedded into a test net and, and see how we can pretty much replicate the tests that we run now with just one or two clients with the vast majority of clients at, at once. So we can ensure that everything works out of the box. Great. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's a couple more questions and I'll, I'll try to transfer them over to the white block telegram. Um, but if we didn't answer your questions fully or um, you, you weren't able to join us for, for the whole talk, this will be, this has been recorded and we'll be uh, releasing it on the white block YouTube channel. So if, if you weren't able to um, attend um, or you want to refer the, the video to somebody else, you can, you can pass that along to them. But Antoine, if you want to, wrap up, uh, go ahead. And thanks, Trenton. And then, of course, if you'd like to get involved and in, you'd like to have a look, um, if two is an open source effort, uh, it's um, available here on GitHub. You can see the specs here. Um, the Artemis team uh, always uh, likes patches. Uh, you can go see them on the Pegasus engine Artemis. Um, I recommend, of course, that you get in touch with Prism if you're interested in Go coding. Uh, don't be shy, also join the Discord. They are very friendly folks. And uh, if you have any interest in Genesis, uh, our code is actually open source. You can take a look under this repo. Uh, as for me, um, Antoine, CTO at White Block, you can here get my email, my Twitter, my Telegram handle. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, as Trent mentioned, we have a White Block community on Telegram. You can get there. You can ask any questions you like. We'll try to run through a series of uh, se sessions as well there. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Vitalik, uh, Preston, Jem. Thank you so much for helping out uh, and run this webinar. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host you all. Uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody.